I've often been asked to write the story of my life. For those that know me, know it has been an eventful one. My life might sound like a dream or a nightmare to the matter-of-fact reader, but nevertheless, everything I have written is strictly true. Much has been omitted, but nothing has been exaggerated. I was born a slave, was the child of slave parents. I didn't know my father well, though I was old enough to know my mother's heartbreak when they took him away for the final time. I was only a child when my mother's brother, after losing a set of plow lines that was entrusted to him by his master, chose to hang himself from a willow tree in place of facing the types of punishment his master gave. Though I must pass rapidly over the stirring events of my early life, When I was about 16 years old, I went to live with my master's oldest son. He was a Presbyterian minister with his helpless wife. She was morbidly sensitive and imagined that I regarded her with some kind of ill feeling because of her poor parents. You are the new slave? Yes, mistress. You're late. Apologies, mistress. I was their only servant, and I was a gracious loan at that. Ah, Elizabeth. Good morning, Mr. Burwell. I uh, apologize that I cannot ask about the family, but I have an appointment in town, though my wife will inform you about what needs to be done. Follow me. I'll show you where you'll find the cleaning equipment. Excuse me, mistress, but do I not get to see my quarters? Despite all the evil that happened at the time, my mother and I were treated with a certain amount of decency from my previous home. You haven't finished the weeds yet, and the laundry is still wet. I swear I don't see the point in having you here. Not treated with the spot that my new mistress showed me. Girl, I am talking to you. I've hung them up as you asked, but I cannot make the sun dry them any faster. Just because you're a loan to us doesn't mean you're any higher rank than any of the new girl we may have bought. She whom I called mistress seemed to be desirous to wreak vengeance on me, and Mr. Bingham, the village schoolmaster, became her ready tool. No, Mr. Bingham, I shall not take down my dress before you. Moreover, you shall not whip me unless you prove the stronger. Nobody has the right to whip me but my own master. And nobody shall do so unless I can prevent it. I believe that I could have forgiven everything for the sake of one kind word. But that kind word was never offered. 
Though I had faults, I know. I felt that the harshness and the cruelty was the poorest way to ever correct them. Master Robert, Mr. Bingham has just flogged me. I know. Why? Why did you allow this? What have I done that I should be so punished? Go away. I will not leave. I will know why I have been punished. The weeks that followed were not easy on me. I must warn you, sir, that if you plan on repeating your actions from last week, then I am ready to die before allowing you to conquer me. And I wish I could say that was the end of it. But after that time, evil had ended. Mr. Burwell, he who had preached love from heaven, was urged by his wife to replace Mr. Burwell, punishing me himself. And the Lord said, May the proud be confounded, for they go wickedly about to destroy me. I shall not strike you again. And faithfully, he kept his word. I feel as though I must apologize for the ending of this story, for it is not in any sense traditional, nor a happy one. That is, unless you count simply having the knowledge that these revolting scenes created a great sensation at the time and that I could have flattered myself that those who conspired against me would have been seen for exactly what they were. But I suppose that's what's tragic about real life. One rarely gets the chance to have a truly happy ending. I refused to stop searching for that happy ending, and I did not, and eventually, we found our happiness, and we earned our freedom.